So on the day of his 16th birthday, Johnny goes to his dad and says, Dad, now that it's my 16th birthday, I have something to talk to you about. I'm going to get my license, and I want you to buy me a car. <laughs> and his dad says, okay, we can do that. However, I have three things that I want you to do before I hand over the keys. <coughs> One, I want you to get a job and start getting 10% of each paycheck to our church. Two, I want you to start reading your Bible every day. And three, I want you to cut your long hair. So Johnny said that this was something easy, and he shouldn't have any trouble doing it. So during the first week after his talk with his dad, he went to the local ice cream parlor, and he got him a job. And he worked real hard, and he got his first paycheck, and he paid his tithing to the church. As was promised, the second week, he began to get up every morning and read his Bible even before eating breakfast. And then he said, it's time to go back to Dad. So he said, Dad, I've done everything you've asked me to do. I went and got a job. I've worked hard. I've paid my tithes. I've gotten up every morning and I've read my Bible. It's time for me to get my car. And his dad says, you didn't do everything I asked you to do. There's still one thing. I asked you to cut your long hair. And he said, yeah, I know, Dad. But, you know, I've been thinking. The more that I read my Bible and the more that I see pictures of Jesus, Jesus has long hair. So I think if Jesus has long hair, then it's probably okay for me to have long hair. And his dad says, yeah, you're right. Jesus did have long hair, and he walked everywhere he went. <laughs> Johnny's story is very similar to that that we hear in our gospel lesson this morning. The story of the prodigal son, or the lost son, as it has also been deemed. And this is one of the most famous stories found in Scripture and in Jesus' teaching. This is a story that has been told over and over and over in numerous fashions and genres. And in, pre in preparation for today, I found that the story of the prodigal has been depicted numerous times in medieval art and paintings and sculptures. And the story of the prodigal was so popular in the 15th and 16th centuries that it could be considered a subgenre of the English morality play. In 1869, Arthur Sullivan orchestrated an oratorio based on the parable. In 1929, using the music of Sergei Prokofiev, George Valentine choreographed a ballet using the story. The Rolling Stones recorded a song called Prodigal Son, and Kid Rock released a different song with the same title. Um, Billy Joel composed a song called Prodigal Blues, comparing his drug addiction to this parable. In the musical Godspell, the story of the prodigal is retold as a Western film. In 2005, Rainforest Films released a movie called The Gospel, and it's actually a very good movie. And it's a contemporary retelling of the prodigal story, in which the prodigal son is portrayed as a successful young R&B singer who has an unlikely homecoming when his father, a pastor, becomes ill. So contemporary and historic media alike have retold the story over and over and over. And I've just named a few, and I haven't even gone into the Christian realm of things. But before we move on, I want to tell you about one more moving retelling. Spirit-filled retelling. Have you seen The Color Purple? At the end of the movie, before Celie and her sister and children have been reunited, we see Suge Avery singing in the juke joint. Now, Suge grew up in the church, and she left her life of salvation and holiness 
to sing that worldly music in those worldly, sin-infested, alcoholic establishments. <laughs> and as Suge is singing to all those sinners at the juke joint, the scenery keeps jumping back and forth from the juke joint to a church. And in that church, her dad is currently preaching and preparing the choir to get ready for the altar call. From a distance, Shug can hear the amazing church choir singing, maybe God is trying to tell you something. <laughs> and she decides to have everyone stop everything that they're doing so that she can listen in. From far off, she starts humming along and singing the solo that she used to sing in that very church. A minute later, she feels the spirit rise up within her, and she begins to sing and hum and walk to that church. And a minute later, she stops walking and she starts running. And the next thing you know, everyone with her is following her lead. Behind her is that trombonist just running with that thing. <laughs> and she gets to that church and she opens the doors up. And she walks in with much gusto. She sings, Speak, Lord, speak to me. Maybe God is trying to tell me something. And after the shock wears off, the church soloist, which I believe is her sister, folds into singing with the choir and allows Shug to continue singing her solo, her song. And with tears in her eyes, she runs to her father, still at the pulpit, and says, See, Daddy, sinners have soul, too. Amen. In my best imitation of Reverend Patrick, this would definitely be Hey. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Not just a mm, but a mm. passion and the spirit of that song that can't do anything but be expressed. For many of us, especially me, with evangelical backgrounds, <laughs> this story of the prodigal is one that was reiterated from pulpits time after time after time. The sermon had ended and the invitation was given for all to come forward for a better understanding of Christ. Or as my grandmother and many others would say, to ask Jesus into your heart. The preacher stands at the altar and waits for everyone to respond. Didn't matter if you've been there the week before, you can still respond and come on up. And she would say, children, come home. Stop running. The Father is here waiting with open arms to welcome you and to celebrate your coming. And I'm sure that many of you know that speech very well. You know, the underlying theme to this parable is forgiveness. And there